So welcome to the second, this is only our second uh, <clears throat> webinar. It's a collaboration between the UNCG Graduate School and UNCG University Libraries. So this is the finals. Um, so this is a collaboration again with, a lot, with uh, between the Graduate School and the library. So first up is Greg Bell um, to talk quickly about this competition. Okay, so thanks, Sam. Um, it's definitely a pleasure uh, to be here and to be able to welcome you uh, to uh, the second annual uh, Webinars Worth Watching competition, as Sam said. Um, this was born a few years ago from a desire to uh, hold a research competition that was open to all um, UNCG graduate students, whether they be on campus or um, online. Um, and so, the, you know, a, a competition that would include everyone. And I, I, I don't think that when we envisioned this for the first time two and a half years ago, we had any idea um, how relevant uh, giving great webinars would be um, in 2020 and 2021. Um, so uh, all of these uh, contestants that we see today are finalists. Um, they all have amazing presentations and I'm looking forward to, uh, to uh, seeing what they have to share with you all today. So welcome again and uh, thanks. Okay, sorry, I was getting the stuff out. <clears throat> So I'm Sam Harlow, um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the online learning librarian. So again, that's why I de developed this with the graduate school as a collaboration. Um, you know, again, in a, in a world where we never dreamed of uh, where we would be <laughs> a year ago uh, today. So welcome. Um, so I feel like Greg kind of covered it, and I feel like, again, in this world we live in, in almost March 2021, I was thinking about, it's been about a year of, uh, since I remember first talking about COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but we developed this, as Greg said, as a way to kind of showcase uh, research and also as a way to include our online graduate students at UNCG, which are a very important <coughs> program, um, as well as kind of <coughs> this idea of being able to quickly pitch right, quickly do an elevator pitch of your research uh, to a broad amount of audiences. So part of this judging challenge, and um, you saw the, the rubric was dropped in the chat at the beginning of this of what the judges are gonna be used using, um, is that we do want the researchers to find a way to make their um, very important and usually very complex research accessible to all audiences. So this is the rules of the competition. Um, we use this rubric, which is linked here, um, and I'll drop a link to this presentation in the chat, um, but um, it is also, uh, I threw it in the chat at the beginning and I can put it in again. But we, they, these contestants, graduate students, have to use a PowerPoint <coughs> slide presentation with no more than 10 slides for 10 minutes. Um, so they are um, spoken word, so they can't be like poetry or song. Um, and the minute they start speaking is when I will start timing the presentation on the end. And if you go over 10 minutes, um, I will cut it off and stop it. Uh, but these, uh, they've all had a practice round, so I'm sure that won't happen. Uh, so if you want to learn more about it, we do have a um, go site um, where we have all the contestants, but I will be introducing them in a bit. So thank you to our preliminary judges. This um, comes about because we have a full round of contestants and then we um, kind of do a cumulative score and then that's how we get these finalists. But thank you to these um, preliminary judges, Keisha Carmichael, an instructional designer at UNCG Online, Amy harris Halk from UNCG Libraries, who's head of research outreach and instruction, <clears throat> Vaughn Stewart, the director of the Digital Act Studio. And then thank you to our finalist judges who are here today. Um, we have a very impressive uh, group of finalist judges. So we have Karen Bull, the Dean of UNCG Online. We have Michael Crumpton, the Dean of UNCG University Libraries, and Kelly Burke, Dean of the UNCG Graduate School. So thank you to all our contestants. It was a very competitive competition with very close scores. So I just wanted to give a shout out um, to the other <clears throat> who presented in the preliminaries, um, but couldn't make it today. And if they're here, thank you so much for coming um, and competing. It was all great at, as the other finalists can attest because they saw a lot of these. Um, thank you. And uh, all of the research is super impressive. So now we're gonna get started with the actual competition. So I'm gonna ask all the um, panelists to mute themselves, um, including judges, except for Morgan. And Morgan, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. Um, can you see my presentation now? 
Yes, and let me um, get my timer out. And then um, also panelists, you're welcome to um, turn your camera off um, if you want. Um, Morgan is presenting and we will um, stay muted and not distract her uh, for this 10 minutes. And I have my timer up and I heard you fine, Morgan. Um, again, remember everyone, if you just came in, just one more reminder, there will be prompts in the chat. So to participate in the chat, you are all welcome to um, attendees and panelists. Be sure to switch your chat to all panelists and attendees or only panelists can see your chats. Thank you. Okay, one second here, getting the chat pulled up. Alrighty. Hi everyone, and thank you so much for joining today. Uh, my name is Morgan Frost, and I'm a third year PhD student in the biology department. And I'm so excited to get to share a bit about my research here with you today. But before we dive in, has anybody ever heard of invasive species? And with that, can anybody actually name any invasive species? And if you would, just take a second to type your answers out into the chat. Lionfish, kudzu, some people have, wisteria, zebra mussels, yeah, those are big ones. Awesome. So I see that some of you have heard of invasive species and can name some, um, but in case you haven't, maybe you've driven down the highway and seen something like this. This invasive plant is called kudzu, and it chokes out our tree lines. Or Maybe you've heard of the explosion of Burmese pythons decimating our native wildlife populations in the Everglades. Or maybe you've heard stories of lionfish devouring everything in our fragile Caribbean coral reefs. Invasive species wreak havoc in nearly every ecosystem on the planet, and they cause billions of dollars in damages every single year. So an ecosystem is just a combination of all of the living organisms in an area and how they interact with the non-living parts of the environment. And how an invasive species can move into an ecosystem and change it can have consequences for all of the living and non-living components of that ecosystem, which affects um, all of the ecosystem's resources that we rely on. So while not quite as flashy as giant snakes, invasive species, invasive grass species, like what's circled here in red in this picture, can cause major damage. And our working rangelands in the United States are yet another example of an ecosystem threatened by invasive species, and in particular, invasive grasses. Therefore, I am working to find out how invasive grasses can negatively affect rangelands. Because how an invasive species impacts our rangelands can affect how long we can use these ecosystems and even our long-term global food security. So rangelands are these beautiful natural areas that we get to use for several different purposes. And importantly, we use them for growing our steaks and hamburgers on. But invasive grasses threaten to destroy that resource, which means we may all end up as vegetarians a bit sooner than we think. So my research will give ranchers new information, which will allow them to change their grazing practices depending on invasion. But what are rangeland ecosystems and why are they so important? So when I say the word rangeland, what comes to mind, maybe besides Outback Steakhouse? Um, please take a second to type in the chat what you hear of or what you think of when you hear the word rangeland. But to back up a bit, though, you may have heard of grassland ecosystems. And grasslands, which you may have guessed, are just um, ecosystems with continuous grass cover. And they cover about 40% of the surface of the earth. And you can see that here in green in this map. And just in the United States, rangelands cover about 36% of our total land area. And awesome, I see some of you guys think of cows, Kansas, cowboys, states like Wyoming, bison, open spaces, grazing pastures, all of these awesome things when we think of rangelands. So you guys guessed it, rangelands are areas of lands that we use to graze our livestock on. 
And this frequently overlaps with grasslands. And you can see that circled in red here in this picture. But aside from giving us our food for our livestock, which is just one important thing that we get from rangelands, rangelands are also home to a large variety of species, which means that they are super biodiverse. However, like I've mentioned a few times already, rangelands are threatened by invasive species. Therefore, my research focuses on understanding the impacts of invasive grasses on rangelands. And this includes not just the impacts on the other plant species, but also on other parts or communities of the food web, or what we call different trophic levels, like the insects and the soil bacteria. It's super important to understand how invasive species impact many rangeland communities in order to continue using our rangelands long term. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus specifically on some of my field projects. I study rangelands in Wyoming and Montana, which in my opinion are some of the most gorgeous places in the country. But if you can see these red and green grasses in these pictures, or closer up here, these landscapes are inundated with what we call invasive brome grasses. And in particular, these two species called Bromus arvensis um, and Bromus tectorum cover much of our U.S. rangelands. And just as a shorthand, we call these species BRAR, or B-R-A-R for Bromus arvensis, and BIRDIE, or B-R-T-E for Bromus tectorum. But even though these species are all over, it's not really known how they impact the different trophic levels that I previously mentioned. And so that's where my research comes in. So in Wyoming and Montana, I have two projects set up to understand this problem. I've set up plots along natural invasion gradients, meaning that they range in invasion abundance from low to high invasion. And using gradients like this allows us to see how invasion relates to different aspects of the native rangeland communities and can then inform management decisions. So in each of these projects, I have sampled the plant, insect, and soil microbial communities, as well as several environmental or what we call abiotic variables. So far, we have found that these two species may not impact the native community in the same way, which suggests that we may need to manage rangelands differently depending on the species. And this is really important because typically land managers think about managing invasive brome grasses kind of all together, instead of considering how each species behaves individually. We have also found that as invasion abundance increases, less light gets to the soil surface. And this is super important because it can change what native plant species are able to live there. And this then can affect the amount of forage or, what, or food that's available to livestock. Finally, we have also found that insect abundance doesn't change with invasion. So the same amount of insects are in highly invaded areas as in areas of little invasion. And when we combine this with pressure from grazing, it can put a lot of stress on our native plant species. And this is important because just in general, livestock prefer the nutrition that's associated with native plant species. So while these projects are all still in progress, they can help us inform land managers and stakeholders on how best to manage their range long term. So for example, on heavily invaded areas, ranchers may choose to graze their livestock more intensely while the invasive species are still growing earlier in the season. Whereas later in the season, they may choose to graze less intensely when the native species are growing in order to allow the native community time to recover. Understanding how invasion changes our landscapes will allow ranching practices to adapt while upholding the highest quality forage possible. And this will simultaneously allow us to protect our native biodiversity and numerous other resources 
that our rangelands provide. So with that, I'd like to take just a second to thank my advisor, Dr. Sally Kerner, for all of her support and direction on these projects. And I'd also like to thank the field staff um, in Wyoming and Montana for their help as well. And finally, I thank um, the graduate school and the biology department for funding and their support as well. And here are my citations, and I thank all of you as well for tuning in to listen. Thanks so much. Yay! This is my clapping since I can turn my, my um, mic on. So you were at nine minutes, 38 seconds. So great job, under 10. Um, so we are going to have a second uh, while the judges maybe take notes, finish your, the rubric for you um, just before we um, go on to our next contestant. So um, I meant to put this, but here is um, Morgan's title and advisor um, in the chat. And then I'm going to go with who our next up person is. Um, so this time I did do alphabetical. So next up is Kelsey. My last name. So I'm um, going to put Kelsey's information in the chat. So remember, if you're joining us um, as we're, um, you know, getting ready to go to our next contestant, uh, this is a competition of graduate students from all over UNCG. Um, and welcome. If you're outside of UNCG, we are happy to have you here. Please stay if you're able until the end so you can vote at the People's Choice Award. There will be prompts in the chat, as you probably saw with Morgan. Um, so be sure to switch your chat to all panelists and attendees so we can all see your chats. Um, and congratulations. And uh, we'll get ready. So Kelsey, uh, judges, do you feel good about letting the next contestant go? Can you all see that? Yes. Great. Okay, judges, are we good for Kelsey, um, for me to give Kelsey the go ahead? I'm good. Okay. I'm seeing thumbs ups. Okay. Okay, again, you know the deal, Kelsey. <laughs> all right. Um, Okay, so hi everyone, my name is Kelsey Hobbs and I'm a PhD student in the economics department here at UNCG. And today I'm really excited to be presenting just a portion of my dissertation titled Explaining the Variation in Rental Housing Eviction Rates Across U.S. Counties. So before I get into my actual research, I do want to start by making sure that we all understand exactly what eviction is. So eviction is the process through which a landlord can remove an individual or a family from their rental property. Now landlords are able to file for eviction for a number of reasons, but the most common one that you're going to find is non-payment of rent. And in my dissertation, I'm going to be focused in particular on eviction rates. And this is simply going to be the number of evictions over the number of renter occupied households in an area. Now, the reason why we want to be concerned about eviction and eviction rates in particular is that eviction has been associated with a number of negative consequences, including homelessness, residential instability, physical and mental health issues, and even lower educational attainment amongst children. So this is certainly an important issue, and it's not only an issue where those negative consequences affect the people that experience them directly, it's also something that affects the communities in which they live. So now that we have a general idea of what eviction is, I want to pose a question to the chat. And that question is, where do you think Greensboro's eviction rate ranks compared to other large cities in the US? So you can drop your answers in the chat box. So I'm seeing higher from um, people that are answering high, higher, high, um, top 25%, very specific, I like that. <laughs> and then I really don't know, and that's perfectly fine. So just like in the uh, preliminaries, there's kind of a mixed bag of responses in terms of where Greensboro's eviction rate ranks, and that's totally fine. So as of 2016, um, Greensboro's eviction rate was actually number seven in the nation compared to other large cities. So really high. So all of you who guessed high or in the top 25%, you're totally correct on that. And not only was that eviction rate the, one of the highest in the nation, it was also the highest of large cities in North Carolina. 
And so I do want to give you guys an idea of what eviction rates have looked like over time. So this graph here plots Guilford County's eviction rate over time, um, and that's where Greensboro is located, compared to North Carolina and the United States as a whole. And so as you can see, uh, Guilford County's eviction rate, where Greensboro has been, is located, has been consistently higher than not only the eviction rate in North Carolina, but also the eviction rate in the United States over really the last decade. So us having a high eviction rate is not something that's new within the last few years. It's an ongoing issue that we're facing here in Guilford County and in Greensboro in particular. And so this graph is actually what's really driving my question in my dissertation, which is why do some counties have such high eviction rates compared to others? I'm really interested in knowing what about Guilford County allows us to have such a high eviction rate compared to other places in North Carolina and other places in the United States. And so the way that I'm going to go about answering this question is using data because I'm an economist. So I'm going to use data from nearly all U.S. counties from 2005 to 2016, and I'm going to use regression analysis to answer this question. Now, regression analysis is really just a fancy term saying that I'm going to use a mathematical model to compare different counties with different eviction rates and see which factors, economic factors like rent or income or poverty, and which demographic factors like racial composition of the county or family status um, are most strongly associated with higher eviction rates. So let's look at these results. So I want to start by looking at the economic results. So I have a table here that's going to show you the different factors that I looked at, and it's going to determine whether those things increase or decrease eviction rate in a certain area. So the first thing that I looked at was rent. And when we increase the rents in an area, we see an increased eviction rate. This makes sense. If rents are higher, it might be more difficult for people to pay them, and as a result, they might face eviction more often. Similarly, when we increase the incomes in an area, we see a decrease in the eviction rate. Again, this makes sense. If people have more income, then it's more likely that they're able to stay on top of their rental payments and not be filed on for eviction. Now, the next result is a little bit counterintuitive. So I find that when poverty in area increases, we actually see a decrease in the eviction rate. And I explain this result by thinking that areas that have higher poverty perhaps also have higher social services or um, support for people that are behind on rental payments. And as a result, that helps the eviction rate go down. I also look at whether unemployment affects eviction rates. And I find that if we increase the unemployment in an area, we do increase the eviction rate. And then finally, I find that areas that are more urban also tend to have higher eviction rates. So I think these results are pretty straightforward. They're not telling us anything that maybe we wouldn't expect other than the poverty result. We would expect that economic uh, issues would be affecting eviction rates as the reason why most people are evicted is for non-payment of rent. So the demographic results, which I'm going to show you next, are the ones where things become a lot more interesting. So the first thing that I looked at was the percent of black residents in an area. And I find that if there are more black residents in a county, we actually see higher eviction rates. When I look at the percent of Hispanic residents in an area, as that increases, we see a decrease in eviction rates. When I look at areas that are more segregated, particularly between black and white residents, we also see an increase in the eviction rates. So more segregated areas tend to have higher eviction rates. I also find that when there's more single mothers in a county, there's higher eviction rates. And finally, as the education in an area goes up, the average education, I find that uh, the eviction rates decrease. And so these are the factors that are a bit more surprising and honestly a bit shocking when we think about eviction because it really shouldn't be based off what people look like or what their family status is or how much education they have, whether they're getting evicted or not. And I've already controlled for economic indicators like income and rent. So this is outside of those things. Uh, these factors here seem to be affecting eviction rates. And although my research can't prove that discrimination is going on, um, the fact that these things are contributing to differences in eviction rates across U.S. counties really suggests that there might be discrimination present in the rental housing market. And so I think this um, 
uh, has implications for public policy. So the economic uh, factors that affect differences in eviction rates, I think there's a pretty straightforward solution uh, to, to solving that problem. And that's really making sure that there's enough affordable housing. We know from my research that um, lower rents and higher incomes help to decrease eviction rates. And as a result, making sure that there's access to affordable housing for all people is going to help decrease eviction rates in an area. On the flip side with the demographic factors, I think this is a lot more difficult to address with public policy, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. So in terms of demographic factors, I think the biggest thing is trying to prevent discrimination in the rental housing market. I think it's difficult to do this because we can't just um, look at every single landlord at every time they go to evict someone and make sure that they're evicting people for the right reasons. But I do think that things like making sure that tenants have um, lawyers when they go to court would be one step in helping people um, not be discriminated against. And so um, that is my presentation. Here are the credits and thank you for listening. You were at eight minutes, 35 seconds. I think I stopped it like a second or two late, but good job in the 10 minutes. So thank you. People are saying great job in the chat. So again, Remember everyone, this is the part where we're gonna give our judges a couple of minutes to collect their scores, take notes, um, and remember um, the things that are going on. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Hi, I'm Mac Pearson, and I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in the kinesiology department. I study applied neuromechanics, and my advisor is Dr. Chris Ray. Today, we're going to talk about implementing optimal theory, lower extremity tasks to reduce the risk of injury. When we learn tasks, skills, or knowledge, we typically learn to eventually perform. That performance is actually a retention of knowledge and the transfer of knowledge. Retention is known as remembering what you learned, and transfer is being able to apply that knowledge to a different situation. As we see in the pictures, these learned skills can be put into action in varying situations. My research tends to focus on more athletic and sport-related movement. I concentrate on how learning new or modified movements can help us move more efficiently and effectively to reduce injury. I'm interested in reducing injury because as a high school and college athlete, I saw 22 of my friends, teammates, and opponents tear their ACL in front of me, and it's devastating. I knew at some point I wanted to make a positive impact in reducing this injury. This picture is of the inside of our knee. Our knee is made up of four very important ligaments, but the one we're going to focus on today is the ACL, or anterior cruciate ligament. This ligament helps stabilize the knee when we're running, jumping, pivoting, and landing. And as I, you, you might have guessed, it, because of its job, this ligament gets injured frequently. Tearing your ACL is a severe injury that can sideline an athlete for nine months to two years or never return to sport. In fact, one in 3,500 people will tear their ACL, ACL this year alone. And women are two to eight times more likely to tear their ACL than men. To help combat this severe issue, in the late 1990s, ACL injury prevention programs began. They were designed to aid and teach proper movement to help reduce injury. They focused on limiting knee valgus and limiting the collapse of your knees during movement and aiding knee flexion or more bend when you take off and land from activity. But not much has changed in the 25-ish years that they've been used. While effective, there is a need for improvement. ACL injury is not, has not decreased since the inception of these programs in the last, again, 25 years. One way to help aid ACL injury prevention programs is adding motor learning theories. A relatively new theory as of 2016 is called optimal theory. Optimal theory is made up of three effective components to aid learning. Optimal theory is typically utilized through instructions or the way we talk to people during activity. The first component of, is external focus. An external focus of attention is focusing on the outcome of the movement rather than the body in motion. 
For example, when instructing a squat, you would typically say, push your hips to the back wall. But using an external focus of attention cue would be to sit back as if you're sitting in a chair. Notice we don't mention the body at all. The second component is enhanced expectancies. Enhanced expectancies is a false sense of confidence. For example, when we are performing a task, especially a new task, we don't want to be the worst one doing it. So hearing instructions telling us we are as good or better than others helps us focus on learning the task rather than how we might look performing it. And the third component is autonomy of support. This is all about feeling as though we have some, some sense of control in the situation. For example, we typically utilize this by giving the participant control over when or if they receive feedback or when and if they get a break or rest. Because this is fairly, fairly new theory, it hasn't been tested in the lower body and certainly hasn't been tested in lower body movements to help reduce the risk of injury. So this was really my first thought when I read optimal theory for the first time. Wait, would this work? And how can I apply this? So I tested it. I wanted to use a fairly stationary task or still task so we could focus the instructions on something pretty specific. I wanted to use a transfer task that was similar enough uh, to our main task that we could examine the same variable. I chose a box squat pictured here to the left as our main task and the depth drop pictured to the right as our transfer task. We tested 75 people to see the extent that optimal theory could work. The optimal group received instructions with all three components. They focused on keeping those black dots, as you can see to the left on our person squatting. They focused on keeping those in alignment and parallel. No group received instructions on the depth drop or transfer task because we wanted to see what they could transfer from the box squat to the depth drop. Our study really had three goals. We wanted to know what could they learn, what could they retain, and what could they transfer. And what we found was that optimal theory did work in the lower body. The optimal group outperformed all the other groups in aiding hip knee alignment. As we see in the picture to the right, that valgus or a knee collapse, that's what we don't want to see. The optimal theory group, or the picture to the left, was able to create those parallel knees, so our hip, knee, and ankle are all in alignment. The optimal group was able to learn, retain, and transfer proper hip, knee alignment. And this was a critical step to see if the optimal theory would work in the lower body. But we don't get injured standing still. We get injured when we're on the move. So testing optimal theory in a more dynamic movement is the next step. This is my dissertation, moving to that dynamic task. This is so exciting because we're taking what we do in the lab and applying it in a real world situation. There's no standard biomechanical equipment like markers, sensors, lights, or fancy force plates that might alter the way our participants or athletes move. We're testing in a gym where athletes move and feel comfortable. I chose a simulated basketball rebound as our main task. Coming down from a basketball rebound or land is a popular movement to get injured. So the optimal theory group received instructions to land safely. I chose the maximal effort vertical jump as our transfer task. All participants had to do is jump as high as possible, but they got no instructions how to land properly. Again, we looked at hip knee alignment as before, as seen in the picture to the left, comparing that hip to the knee distance but we also added knee flexion or the amount of bend as we can see in the picture to the right. We really want both variables are risk factors for ACL injury. Similar to before, we wanted to know to what extent could optimal theory impact learning, retention, and transfer in a dynamic task. And what we found was that optimal theory worked in a dynamic task. The optimal theory group learned, retained, and transferred better hip knee alignment and added more knee flexion or bend in our knee. These findings are so exciting. What we learned is that you can teach and modify lower body movements that could lead to injury reduction. This holds a lot of importance in ACL injury prevention programs because there's no way you could practice every single movement or reaction to ensure your body is moving safely. So transferring the safer movements to other situations 
is an ultimate goal of ACL injury prevention programs. To end, I want to leave you with a takeaway message of my work. First, we can change and alter our mechanics to promote safer, more effective movement. It doesn't require a large monetary investment. Simply changing the way we give instructions can have an impact. Specifically for ACL injury prevention programs, implementing the optimal theory is a great addition to already established programs to help increase their effectiveness. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, but making small changes could have a large impact. Ultimately, optimal theory has limitless potential. This could be used in sport, rehabilitation, music, academics, you name it. We all learn. If you take away anything from today, I want you to remember, if we change instructions, we can change the way we move. And a special thanks uh, to the graduate school, obviously my advisor, Dr. Chris, Chris Ray, and the kinesiology department, my friends, and especially my family for their support. Thank you. Great job. You were at nine minutes, 20 seconds. Um, great. Thank you. So again, y'all have, most of you, I think, have been here the whole time. Um, we will now give the judges a couple of minutes to uh, collect their scores. You are getting uh, praise in the chat. I'm praising you. And then we will go. Uh, we do have one more. Again, remember, if you're coming in, that we, uh, that we will be doing a People's Choice Award. So don't leave. Um, I see someone raise their hand um, that we are in Zoom webinar. So if you have any questions or want to say anything, please let us know in the chat. Um, because in this way, we can't turn cameras on or um, mics on. So um, let us know in the chat. Um, someone's here from Nebraska. Good job, Mac. <laughs> um, I liked that shout out of where you are. And so our next up is uh, in the chat. And you can see her title on the screen. And y'all, I think, again, know the deal by now. And I'm going to mute and go uh, silent on my video. And you get started when you feel comfortable. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yuki Sugimoto. Um, I am a doctoral candidate from the Department of Kinesiology, and I am very excited to be here. And today I'll be sharing my pilot study results for my dissertation. So how many people have sprained your ankle in your lifetime? I'm using Zoom chat, so if you could participate by saying yes and no, that would be great. Yes, I see a lot of yeses. Yeah, okay, great. So the fact is, 23,000 ankle sprains happen daily. That is quite a lot, right? So the ankle sprain is one of the most common musculoskeletal injuries in general public. Up to 74% of individuals who suffer an initial ankle sprain experience recurrent ankle sprains and develop chronic ankle instability, known as CAI. Individuals with CAI often develop osteoarthritis, that is a degenerative joint disease, and report decreased health-related quality of life. So our research focuses on individuals with chronic ankle instability, CAI, to enhance their quality of life and to prevent development of osteoarthritis. So do you like to play soccer or do you like to watch soccer? Yes or no? So I myself played soccer. So I am using soccer as an example. There are three elements that affect you from achieving an optimal performance. These elements are environment, task, and yourself. Based on the picture you see, the environment is a soccer field and the task is a kicking a ball or beating your opponent. And your health status, if you are healthy or injured, play a big role to achieve an optimal performance. Your health status will also affect your ability to use different sensory systems to coordinate motor behaviors. So do you know what three sensory systems that we use to coordinate our motor behaviors? Do you have any ideas? 
now. <laughs> so these sensory systems are vision, vestibular, that is part of your inner ear, and somatosensory systems. The somatosensory system includes sensory feedback from your skin, muscles, joint, and ligaments. When we say somatosensory in this study, we are referring to the sensory feedback from the ankle. Healthy individuals have an ability to flexibly integrate these three sensory systems based on environments and tasks to coordinate motor behaviors. However, individuals with chronic ankle instability, like David Beckham, demonstrate impaired sensory motor systems. More specifically, CAI individuals display somatosensory deficits at the ankle, altering their ability to feel the environment to provide stability. As a result, CAI individuals display impaired balance. So do you know if you have a good balance or have you been tested for your balance before? Yes or no? Medium yoga, <laughs> never been tested. So balance affect your performance. Thus impaired balance will increase the risk of regarding ankle sprains while playing sports. In order to compensate impaired somatosensory, which is a sensory feedback from the ankle, the study suggests CAI individuals heavily rely on vision to maintain good balance. However, the gap still exists in the literature to understand how sensory systems are integrated when there is an increasing complexity of task and environment. Thus, the purpose of my study was to understand how individuals with, uh, with CAI, chronic ankle instability, use each sensory system to coordinate balance, especially when task and environmental complexity was increased by manipulating each individual sensory system compared to healthy individuals. So how many people are familiar with neural machine that you see in the picture? Anybody? I'm assuming not many people are, right? No? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. The neural machine you see in the picture manipulates individual sensory systems. There are four conditions. The complexity of the task and environment increased as the number of conditions increased. Condition one was baseline balance test with all sensory systems available. Condition two to four examined the ratio of each sensory system participant used to maintain balance relative to condition one. So we had 24 physically active individuals, both females and males, participate in my study. As you know, healthy individuals don't have any injured leg. Healthy individuals were assigned an injured leg by the dominance to the CAI group. Participants warmed up on bike for five minutes, then completed a series of three trials of 20 seconds balance tests in the injured leg for individual conditions. So any guess on which sensory systems individuals with chronic ankle instability relied on the most to maintain their balance with the increased complexity of the task and environment? So you have three options, vision, somatosensory, and vestibular. Any guess? Vision? Oh, great. <laughs> all right, so you guys are all correct. Um, due to the small sample size, we did not find any um, group differences. However, we found a trend. CA individuals used more vision and less um, vestibular and somatosensory systems to coordinate balance when task and environmental complexity was increased. So the question now is, how can we retrain those CAI individuals to have better balance to achieve their optimal performance? Do you have any um, ideas that you could share with us? <laughs> Provide vestibular input. Yeah, I see some good ideas. So um, traditionally, we use foam pads that you see in the picture 
to the habitat somatosensory deficit sets at the ankle to improve, improve balance among CAI individuals. Recently, virtual reality has been implemented in clinical settings as a part of rehabilitation. So what sensory feedback do you think virtual reality provides? So again, you have three options, somatosensory, vision, and vestibular. What do you think? Vision, yes. <laughs> yeah, I see a lot of vision. Yeah, so you guys are correct. Um, virtual reality provides visual sensory feedback that's based on our findings, strengthening reliance on vision using virtual reality may improve balance and also performance and overall motor behaviors to prevent recurrent ankle sprains in those individuals with chronic ankle instability, CAI. Thank you. If you have any questions, please feel, uh, feel free to contact me via um, scanning the QR codes. Yay! <laughs> Eight minutes and 35 seconds, uh, if that is uh, relevant. So great job, all of y'all. So um, I, what I'm going to do, because um, the judges are going to finish up their scoring, they're going to be mailing me on the back end. And what I thought could happen here while we're waiting and just for a couple minutes is that if anyone has any questions in the chat um, for one of the contestants, they can answer them while I'm doing the scores in the back end um, or not. Um, but I thought that could kind of fill the time. And then as, again, make sure, here it is. This is the people's choice vote. Be sure to vote. Here it is. So go to that Go link that's in the chat. Um, click on that. It will work on a phone. And let us know. You can only vote for one, and you can only vote one time. Um, but you are all welcome to vote. It should definitely work outside of UNCG. Um, so let us know um, if there's any issues. Um, and I will um, turn my camera off and mute myself, and we will have the scores in a bit. Please don't leave. Vote in that People's Choice. Vote, vote, vote. And then um, we'll be right back to tell you who the winner is. So yeah, and if anyone has any questions, you can switch it to all panelists and attendees. Um, if not, y'all can just have a conversation in the chat. We'll be right back. If the panelists want to say anything, feel free to unmute yourself. So I'd just like to say uh, great job, everyone. Um, congratulations for getting through this. Um, can, does anyone want to say a little bit about the experience of you know, preparing this thing and what it's like if there are people watching that are thinking about doing this next year um, or thinking about, you know, participating in something like this, maybe? Yeah, I can go first. Um, so this is a really good opportunity um, to, again, talk about your research as, as doctoral students or master's students. Um, not many times do you get the opportunity to just openly discuss what you do. And a lot of times our friends and family don't really know what we do and spend so much time doing. Um, and so I think it's a good opportunity almost to practice um, obviously, for some of us entering the job field, hopefully soon, um, it's, it's a different world right now. So entering in a Zoom world or having interviews over Zoom or any, any platform, it's good practice. And I think that this is a good platform to kind of get out there. And it's obviously a little uncomfortable at times and a little nerve wracking, but I think it's an overall a really good experience. I can just oh. echo what Max said. I, apologies, my video is not turning on anymore. Um, but yeah, I, oh, here we go. Here, there it goes. Um, I totally agree. I think it's super important just to be able to convey your research to a broader audience. And um, that's important for a lot of jobs and um, different careers. And so I think it's a really important skill. And it's just a lot of fun getting to meet other people from other departments. Um, I've enjoyed like listening to everybody's talks and everything. And so it's been a really fun experience. Yeah, I agree. Um, I myself struggle, you know, speaking, like breaking down my research in the intern. So this process really helped me to break down my research and then um, speak to the broader audience, for sure. And I think the slides, like limiting how many slides you have and the time is a skill that sometimes when I've gone to conferences, you have 15 or 20 minutes and an unlimited number of slides. And so this is good practice of consolidating your research, which for me has been really helpful because I was on the job market this year. And being able to quickly talk about your research has been really helpful. 
so speaking of that, like, how does this compare? I know some of you have done the three minute thesis um, and then the, the graduate expo. So how does how does the 10 minutes compare to the three minutes? The three minutes seems to me like it would be much more of a challenge. Um, but it's also you, you can't get as deep into your research. So maybe it's kind of easier in that sense. So how, how do they compare? Um, I think for me, um, I did the three minute thesis competition in the fall and it was an opportunity to kind of just expand. Um, so it kind of was like the three minute thesis is like that spark note version, that kind of quick version. And then this kind of give, gave me the opportunity to go a little more in depth. But also that 10 minute, 10 slide is is very challenging sometimes. I think it's nice to be able to do both of them. I did them both too. And again, like being on the job market, like they tell you, at least in our field, like have an elevator pitch of your research and then have the, you know, more 10 minute version for when you're in an interview and they ask you to describe what you do, that sort of thing. So being able to participate in both, I think they each have their merits. And I, for me specifically, I felt like they were really useful to practice like, okay, the exactly what Max said, the Spark Notes version, the Reader's Digest version of your research, and then like the slightly more in depth and then the conference style that maybe you get normally as a graduate student. Very cool. So I don't see any questions in the chats. Let's see, so uh, Dean Burke says, everyone should do this, Mac is correct, this is not going away. Um, I, I think that's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, I actually, I just wanna share with you all that I have actually been in an elevator with someone a graduate student who was giving an elevator pitch to um, uh, uh, one of the members of the General Assembly down in Raleigh. It was it was awesome because this person had their their uh, thirty second pitch down pat. We got in the elevator, the doors closed, and they turned to them and gave their little pitch. It was it was just incredible. So this is a, a really valuable skill. Um, and uh, as as a pure mathematician, um, I I can fully appreciate the challenge of of sharing um, what it is that we do. Um, with, with the general audience. So I saw Sam come back, but maybe she disappeared again. So I'm... I am just calculating. I have all the scores. I'm calculating it. So be back okay. in one minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a mathematician, but I'm not that kind of mathematician. I can't do those sorts of things. I, I noticed Sam didn't even ask. She's like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ask Greg for that. Dean Burke can vouch for that. <laughs> Arithmetic. I will add, I think you all did a great job. So I enjoyed this experience very much. So thank you. Greg, do the students get a copy of their presentation? I'm ready. Oh. Um, they, if they want the feedback, um, I will give them um, the rubrics, but um, without anonymized, um, just like scores and comments. Um, so if they would like those, but it's not required. So, without further ado, uh, make sure that you're getting your People's Choice Awards in if you haven't done that. Our second place winner, that's what I'll do first, our second place winner is Yuki. Yay! So, congratulations. Our first place winner is Morgan. Yay! So thank you all so much. And so I'm about to share my screen on the People's Choice. And here it is. It is Mac. So we have, again, a, a, a nice array. So thank you all. Yay! So Sam, I was asking if the participants get a copy of their recording. They do. So we put this recording okay. on YouTube and we close caption it and it will live on our webinars worth watching website. So you, if you're interested to even compare, you can see the recording from last year. Um, we were still using WebEx as our main source. So it's a little different, you know, in terms of how it flowed and the style. Um, you know, people got opinions. I think this went a little smoother with Zoom um, personally. Uh, but here's the website, so be sure to check out the recording um, after the fact, and I will update it to include our um, first, second, and people's choice. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming and for participating. Um, you are all amazing. I um, am very biased about this competition, but I love seeing the diversity of research. I love seeing 
all the stuff. I love seeing it. I love your slideshows. I love it all. So um, thank you all for coming. If there's um, no other questions in the chat, a congrats again to all of our panelists um, and the winners of the cash prize. We will be in touch. I have your names, of course. We've all been in touch um, with how you will be getting your cash prize because um, that was a part of this competition too. I didn't I don't feel like I emphasize that enough. I should have said that. Y'all get y'all get some money. So um, thank you all for coming and uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all for the judging too. I see Karen in the chat. Thank you. And um, have a great weekend. Great weekend. Wow, words. Bye, everyone. <laughs>